just a second. Everybody see and hear okay? We are starting the research meeting. Just want to double check. I think I got everything on. Looks good. Thanks, Fox. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, we're recording, so I'll get started. Um, this is sort of a preview, sort of a teaser, sort of a me talking about this out loud for the first time, uh, and. So yeah, I'll just run with it. And um, but this is kind of an unpolished version of something where I'll um, have something more concrete soon. Uh, just along the idea of uh, when you talk about hidden stuff, the, it overlaps with it. Okay, the, the idea of not building object-centric models all the time. Um, yeah, that that comes into this that um, object-centric um, models might live purely in the in the connectivity of of cells and not necessarily ever in the activity. Uh, yeah. it, it might be that um, oh, okay. uh, just that it looks in the weights rather than in the cell activity. Uh, but that that's not my, that's not central to this. That'll okay. that'll fall it's, into it's, this. It's but this this isn't built on that. Okay. It, but it overlaps. Just, I just want to understand what the topic you want. Yeah. Okay. So um, so in various. Uh, theories of object recognition, including capsules and including the things I've created posters about. Uh, what gets represented is um, is like what you're what you're viewing and, and like where it is, or equivalently, where is your sensor in the reference frame of the object? Uh, so I mean, right now it's changing, uh, and and basically you're you're actually representing how far away something is. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just a little bit. So, when you say where your sensor is, you're talking about um, location of the eye, not location of uh, the image on the cup and the retina. Uh, correct. That's that's usually what I what I push for, and that's uh, that's also essentially what capsules do. Capsules are will they'll be like a feature with some um, pose, and that's essentially the same thing, a, a feature and where it is in three D space. Um, but it's consistent with that. You can have both, right? You can have a a where path representation of where something is relative to your body. And yeah. You can have a what path representation of where things are relative to the object. Yeah. It, it's not either or, right? Yeah. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make a case that that's not happening at all. But uh, what but, the object centric one? Uh, the the yeah the uh, the viewer centric one. So the 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 idea that you actually okay. Let let me. Uh, hey everybody, thanks for joining. I'm not saying. That anything's not happening, but I'm saying <laughs> for the, an object recognition system, uh, here's what I think uh, happens, or here's what okay, I think it's is not an object representation system. You're saying to, to recognize something, recognizing, or just in general, the object modeling part of the system, oh, the part that's saving what. Okay, the so that's the question: is if you're talking about object modeling, then are you dismissing the idea that object model is built around uh, an object-centric reference frame? No, I'm not dismissing okay. it. Okay. So no. object modeling seems to be, by definition, that way. While object recognition could be an egocentric reference frame. Uh, is that consistent? Maybe I should let you go. But I'm trying to get. It always helps me to get sort of a background of where you're coming from. Yeah. So I, I'll go on. So where I'm coming from um, is like I was I was walking around thinking of like what I was what what was coming into my visual stream. I was riding the train and watching houses in the distance and. The idea that I was when I see this house in the distance on top of a hill, that I am representing the distance from my retina to that uh, was just insane to me. Uh, the way that I'm recognizing this house on a hill in the distance, the neighborhood on the hill in the distance, um, it just seems so apparent to me that like if I were to look at like a model of if I were to just look at like, like you know a Lego model of houses on a hill right here, uh, it would activate the ex almost exact same. Um, representations in my in my brain as seeing the, the, the same image off in the distance. Uh, but you do know the difference between those. You know, yeah, you know the difference. Yeah. So I do know the distance yeah. of that object. It's not like, to say I don't know the distance of the object is, I think, seems all wrong, right? You know the distance. Did I ever say we don't know it? Yeah, so, yeah. I thought you said you did. So um, you said uh, it was this idea that I would know the distance of this thing is, 
the idea that that's part of the process of recognizing what's out there uh, is. Okay, so there's a it's recognition separate from like knowing how far away it is. Okay. Yeah, and like, so the end, so let's think of objects as spatial arrangements of components yeah. or child objects or whatever you want to call them. Uh, so I have a strong suspicion that we recognize spatial arrangements of components in a way that uh, is really in, um, independent of how far away those components are. Uh, yes, I would agree. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm working on that problem of, okay. of building up those types of object models. Okay. Uh, and. But I'm just trying because I think you did say it seemed crazy to me that I know how far away that thing is. But no, you do. I do know how far away it is. And even though maybe because of that, and if you go back to the theory about the thalamus as being a scaling thing, even because of that, you can recognize the objects. If I know how far away it is, then I can actually see that in some sense, see what it is. Uh, okay, I think I got. Okay, so. Yeah. So how is it that I recognize that spatial range of things independent of how far away it is, is, is the question I think you raised. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just start reading off the board. Uh, yeah, a point of view, the brain's object modeling system stores like the relative sizes of child objects, not their absolute size. And I'm going to talk about sizes and distances uh, as all being kind of one, looking at one scale invariant coordinate system, still learning how to talk about it. But uh, here I'm showing a set of these, um, these child objects, these components that are in a certain arrangement. I'm going with kind of this toy approach of just simple shapes and arrangement of to, just to get this off the ground. Uh, um, so likewise, uh, just as like, um, you're, you, okay, so your brain sees this. And actually, one way to frame what I'm doing is, um, is also trying to explain why our brain can just look at photographs or why we can look at a picture of uh, why we can look at drawings and see something coherent. Uh, I, I think I'm also sort of attacking that problem. Uh, when you look at, at this drawing of these three shapes, you have no notion of how large these are. And like, at, at, like if, if, am I showing sky, skyscrapers here? Am I showing like Legos? What are they? That you don't, you don't care as the, as the viewer or uh, you, why, why do you say the brain does not store absolute sizes of objects? Because in, the, in your house example, even though it's further away, I know that house is much bigger than the Lego house example. Yeah, so, right? so it's not like it doesn't store the absolutes. But the process of recognizing a rel relative arrangement of components, uh, building these models of arrangements of components into familiar objects um, is that part happens without any absolutes being involved. Okay. Uh, now there are other like you're saying that because I can recognize things at yeah. scale, right? Yeah. Um, I, I I would I, I was going to say the same too. To, to me, the idea, the idea is you save you save things. You're storing their object at proper size, but then you can infer it at any size. So. It's like the tempo of a song, right? You can you store it at one tempo. I'm, and, I'm not saying you store it at, at a particular size. I, well, I, I think it was. I mean, it, seems, it seems like when I that's a super simple example of how it's perfectly good. I mean, I know how, how big they are and how large they're big and so on. And I don't have a, my model of a house isn't independent. I, I know exactly how big those things are, or at least very closely to how it. And so even though I see a model of it, uh, it's not like that's the same thing. I know now that yeah, it's a model. It's smaller. Um, it just seems to me that the object model itself uh, is dependent on actual sizes, although inference is not. That, that would be my take on that. You're saying otherwise. Here. I think that uh, this the object modeling system um, is is independent of actual size, and then another system that connects to it imposes actual sizes. Okay, I, I, that's a strong claim. So, uh, I think that, okay. yeah, so it was, I think it's, it's, it's inconsistent with this idea that objects are just sensory motor contingencies, right? That you're sort of, uh, that the, uh, looking at the representation of an object allows you to create actions like a saccade to a particular location. Those saccades are going to be uh, size invariant, right? Because the same, like, two degrees of saccade east or west is going to give you uh, the same visual input, time zero and one, regardless of where it is. 
uh, how far away it is, right? Because it's, the, the appearance and retina is the same size. So if you look in terms of sensory motor, it seems like it, it, that seems like evidence for uh, I, the coherence. I, I, I could make, I could, I agree with saccades, but with movements, Brains. it's worse than what we had before. Uh, with, with like actual movement of your body, you can no longer that's predict. That's an important point. So I mean, um, the kind of activity that we're, that we're modeling is relevant to whether we care about scale or not. If we're just looking at visual, uh, visual recognition tasks, all we really care about is where our eyes are within the predictions that we're going to be making based on where that eye is going to land next. But if this is an object that we're about to interact with in some way, in an embodied sense, then you're going to take a step forward. It's going to have a totally different impact on the, yeah. the visual image. So Yeah, so, so one, once, you're, once you're moving around and predicting how it's changing, at that point you need, at that point, you do know the actual size of, of what's in front of you. Not necessarily, uh, you're, you, you, you're not necessarily storing that anywhere. You might, you might see the object immediately and for how large it is and everything like that and represent that in activity. And that's how that prediction would work. So maybe we just look at a very narrow version of this task, which is like you know, fixed observer, just visual um, recognition. All you can do is move your eyes. Then it makes it easier to agree that this is scale invariant. This is a purely visual. Uh, anyway, like, I'm missing your point there, Jeremy. Uh, we say scale invariant. Um, um, well, the idea here is that we are representing object size. You are not. That, that's, what, that's the argument that he's making. Yeah, I know he's making that. What are you making? I think that there's evidence for that from this like pure this, this uh, subset of perception tasks. It's just well, well that's the problem. Would be to stick to a subset, you might right. be like brains. Um, Okay. I, I mean, I think I completely agree. We have to represent uh, scale, especially if we're thinking about approaching this thing. We didn't know how long it's going to take to get there. Everything is in the context of what we're trying to do with it. If we're just yeah, yeah. It just seems like almost everything in the world that you, you interact with on a moment-to-moment -moment basis is at the same scale as when you first learned it, and um, and it seems like that's how you, you learn it. And then somehow we do not. Mark is going to argue otherwise, but to me, it then says, "Oh, then how do I deal with the issue when I'm dealing with something which is not a scale?" It's a shrunk down or a large version of it, um, but but okay. I'll, I yeah. said my point already. And, the, and maybe the, um, maybe things are a little different for com components versus full objects. Uh, okay. Uh, components of objects versus full objects. Uh, so what I think is when you see something like this. Um, you do learn the spatial relationships of the components, uh, but they're in a different kind of, kind of unit. They're not in meters or some equivalent of meters. They're uh, they're essentially like you know that um, you know that this this um, this prism thing is, this distance from this is. Um, you don't know how large it is in terms of meters, but you know that it's about you know about the height of this is is about how far away they are, or it's like um, it's like I don't know like four widths of it away. Uh, that you can tell like if you're looking far off into the distance of the set of buildings, or if you're looking at something that's nearby, you you can tell the relative arrangement of things uh, in a way that that is sort of relative to its own sizes. Well, I mean, you picked a problem here where you have abstract shapes that have no inherent size. So in this case, if, I, if I'm going to rem remember that arrangement and I'm doing it not with physical objects, but if it's a picture like this where I can't really tell what it is, then you're right. I guess I'd have to agree with you in this case. It's, um, um, but that that is, you picked a case where this is, you have, you're forcing me to do it that way, right? I'm just pointing out. I'm not saying and, Or like, if you're looking out the window at a car in the distance and you yeah. see like the various tires and windshield, like, are you actually representing how far away that tire is and that tire is from you? And I, then, like, I, I, didn't say, I didn't say that. I just, uh, we, we have to be careful. I say the object model of a car is an absolute, uh, has absolute dimensions to it. So the model of the car is stored in those dimensions. That's what I'm arguing. At the point I'm inferring it, um, there's a separate question. Do I, do I, am I looking at the, the two tires? Are they the, the absolute size of all two? I don't know. But the model itself, when you, for the first sentence here, is an object modeling system. Um, I, to me, that means the internal representation for what the car is, and that seems to me to have its sizes. Where you're if you're arguing that while well, I'm inferring and looking at something that those don't come into play, I'm more open to that idea. That okay. seems more, uh, you might be right there. Uh, that seems like. 
that's a, it's, that's a more interesting idea that, oh, okay, well, maybe there's a different thing going on while I'm inferring or looking around, and um, which I could, I could totally go for. So you know, I might be including everything about the state, or I'm just picking on what it is you're describing. If you're describing object modeling, I'm, I'm in trouble with it. If you're describing the process of viewing something from a distance, I'm okay. Okay. So, okay. The, I could see this going either way. Whether the actual object model is actually um, some some instance, if it's actually some specific size versus it, the model itself is already uh, designed to. But it almost, it, I can almost guarantee you this the former because if you just ask me to describe a car, I I can tell you how physically large it is. Yep. I mean, it's, it's it's not some unknown. It's like I know how physically large. I can go and tell you how many inches. Or, Walk it out. I got all these things in my head. It's not like I have to say, "Oh, in this particular instance is this big." No, you know, I, I know that. Um, uh, it's it's just that I'm able to view it at different distances and different scales, and I don't get confused by it. So I think that system could still be divided into two parts: a what pathway that is invariant to actual uh, actual distances, and like a where pathway that does. It, the where pathway also has its own model of this. Of Cars and that one does have actual. Oh, interesting. So you say the rear path itself has a model of a car. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that. Not a, not a momentary representation of a car, but uh, I, I'm arguing that in, the, in my head, I actually physically know the dimensions of, you know, there, there's just not scale invariance. It's like I know the physical dimensions of certain yeah. many things. Uh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have that happen by two separate models. I would have one plug in a size to the other. Okay, well, but, I Anyway, uh, okay. Um, so I guess I'll just read this off and then continue to the next part. Uh, so, for purpose, I'm, I'm making these maybe over broad statements, but for purposes of inferring an object, so to insert that before the sentence, uh, we don't represent the distance from the retina to the object. Uh, a given image, like like a cube or a cylinder, um, activates the same representation in say V1 or in the visual stream, whether it's one meter or one mile away. Uh, but we do detect and store the 3D arrangements of the, of the child objects. Um, so I'm, I'm making a, a, a statement about um, 2D versus 3D is kind of, um, it, it's kind of strange at the first stage, if, if I'm getting this right, that, um, that like you see like a cylinder in your visual stream uh, and you're going to represent its like 3D orientation. Um, yeah, you're going to represent its 3D orientation, but you're not really representing its distance away from you. So it's it's sort of like a hybrid two and 3D. Uh, but but you agree, I do know the distance. So you're just saying that there's there's two separate representations. Right? Yeah. There's, a, there's one that says here's the distance to this object. Yeah. And the other one says here's the orientation of the object. Is that what you're saying? Is that uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of them is going to be. Um, the, the one that's like, what is the image on my retina? There is a cylinder that is in a particular retina topic size. Like it's, 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 it's yeah. taking up a certain amount of my retina uh, and it's at a certain orientation. Um, yes, then elsewhere, the where pathway somewhere, um, you're also probably representing how far it actually is away from you because you, you need to know how to interact well, you with it. You know that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know that, so yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, I, here I'm, I'm, I have not bridged this to, um, yeah, I, well, on my to-do list is how does this fit into a system that then knows how to walk over and grab yeah, okay. the So I just, I'm, I'm going to really ask you to be more careful with your language because you said we don't represent the distance from the retina objects. Well, we do. You're just saying I'm not doing that in the process of recognizing the object. Yeah. Okay, so the words matter there. So, okay, I got it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, okay. So here's how I think object models are stored conceptually uh, and this and in this just briefly before I talk through this you can think of the edges as being sort of like a displacement or a transform or a spatial relationship and the points on this are um, the, the points on this are the actual components the actual child objects and I drew three different versions to show like the, here these three dots correspond to these three things at, uh, at these three child objects um, and I'm leaving this very much open to do you store the, you know, the spatial relationship between all pairs of things? Do you choose sort of a, um, an anchor, like a, a, 
like a main object, sort of like the carpet in the room you brought up? Uh, do you choose like a main object to, to do everything else relative to that? That's like this middle picture. Um, oh, sorry, so that middle picture is like, oh, there's one main object, the other two are relative to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, or the third possibility is you you choose some some higher objects that to symbolize all three of these. Uh, like I don't know, you choose some main axis and and figure out where they are relative to that. Uh, uh, all of the any of these could be right. It could be some fluid system that eventually moves from here to here and moves from here to here. Uh, everything I'm saying here doesn't depend on which of these uh, which of these. But they all have sort of different trade offs. Yeah. Each of those. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, my personal guess is that like it starts off doing this, but then it kind of optimizes it to be better. But we'll, we'll see. Uh, but I'm not making a bet on that in this topic. Uh, so each of these dots is like, what is the child object? Uh, it, it's like, is it a, is it like this tall prism, medium prism, is it a cylinder? Uh, and that's really all that is represented for each dot, nothing about an absolute size of any kind. Uh, each of these edges is what is the spatial relationship between this between these two components, uh, and it's also what is the relative size between them. So my bet is that when you see stuff off in the distance, although you might not have very a very precise notion of how far it is away. You can use cues. You can use like here. I drew them as like these dotted lines. But you you have these various clues for figuring out um, how far away, the, how are they actually arranged in three D. Uh, so even though they're just a set of like cylinders and prisms on your retina that are at various like retina topic sizes, you do have this ability to detect their three D spatial relationship. Although you although it's not in meters, it's not in um, world units. So the, the idea is that that when, when you're either saccading from component to component, or when you see a scene of components, what you're what this is what you're detecting is like the the object identities or the child object identities and like their spatial arrangements and their relative sizes, and this that's the information that you want to kind of save away. Uh, and I'll just keep going. Um, so in this view, what is happening in cortex uh, for you to predict your sensory input, this is sort of a sort of lapse. It's so puzzling. Um, you, I don't think I've ever seen you, anything uh, quite like this before. To, you, might, you might focus like your phobia or a particular column on this child object. Uh, and that activates it activates the representation saying that like okay I'm seeing this cube thing this prism thing uh, with uh, per at a particular 3D orientation and it's a particular like size on my retina uh, I have no idea how far away it is at least for purposes of, of um, for, for for purposes of this uh, and using that information I sort of um, plug it into my object model. I, I take it. I'm like, okay, this is one of these dots. I, I know. I know this object already. Uh, that I'm going to plug it into this this dot. And now that I, and since I've saved this information, the three D spatial relationship the scale factor, uh, I can use that to predict that. Like, I can use that basically to figure out. Okay, now I know what motor command I can do to get. To another child object of this of this of this object, another component of this object, and you can you can then generate that motor command saccade, and you can predict this is what image will land on my retina next. And the nice thing is, I mean, this is this is in some ways this is like a boring thing. Saccading and predicting is like very so very simple. You're taking the current size of the object, yeah. using that. Uh, to just to know how far to move to predict the next one. Yeah, and the thing that might not be immediately obvious. Uh, okay, the idea of saccading over an image and predicting stuff might sound boring. So the thing I need to make Why? make clear. Well, the thing I need to make clear is this is a um, you didn't just. It's still a three D object model, which means from another viewpoint, this already will work. From, from another viewpoint, you can this saccading will already work. You might you might have never seen this object from this viewing angle 
and you'll be able to predict using this mechanism. Yeah. What do we need relative size for? Why are we including relative size in addition to these displacements? It seems like uh, so far unnecessary. Uh, are you using relative size to make the prediction better? In this picture, I have not made any use of objects being at different um, different sizes. Um, if I had drawn some of these as being scaled up versions of each other, then it would have worked, or that it would have made a difference. Uh, if if I made like if if this if I scaled this up, made it made something with these exact same um, 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 ratio of height to width, and put it here, um, then then I would have made use of that. Then then like two of these dots would have been the same component type, but a scaled up. Of so you're getting because of you're going to get some benefits of compositionality at some point. Yeah, it, I guess I'm really making use of like, for example, if 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 what you represent in your lower in your lower visual areas is these basic components like cylinders or something that you can make into shapes, uh, then uh, I, I need to come up with a better answer to that. I've, I've changed up this so. Do we need the scale factor bullet there for anything we've talked about so far? It seems like that hasn't been used yet. I guess the weird thing is when you see like when, when you see this and this um, You, it, uh, this might be, I wish I had a good answer to this right now. Um, there's ambiguity of whether, are these the same size? Is this, is this further back and larger? Uh, uh, and in order to store that kind of, so, so suppose I, I tell you like, okay, what, the, what this is actually is two cylinders and this one's actually behind this one. This one's actually far back. Um, then your model, if you were right now learning this composite object, um, your model of it would need to keep track of like, okay, so there's there's a cylinder, and then way back behind it, there's a larger cylinder. Uh, so you need to store way back behind it, and it's larger. If that makes sense. Because you're trying to build a map. So you need to, at some point, you're relative sizing. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, like uh, this all came from uh, me looking around and trying to fit um, what was what I was what I was introspecting with this with these models of object recognition that I know like capsules and the stuff I've proposed, uh, and I was very uncomfortable. I was like, "There's no way that I'm using my like whatever a set of grid cell modules to figure out where my sensor is relative to that far off thing." Uh, that can't that can't be happening, and I was having trouble yeah, getting it work with you keep scaling. That, but I, I I want you to use different language because you also agree that I do know how far away that is, and I'm using grid cells and how far away it is. It's just not you say well, there's no way I'm using grid cells and how far away something is. I disagree with that. You're saying I'm not using that for the inference of this object, sure. but you still know how far away it is, right? I know how far away you are. This is not a guess. Okay. I know how far away you are. So, I, I guess I was using the example of far away things where it's no longer, I no longer have this precise. I hate that I know it's far away. Just the fact you said it's far away, I know it's far away. I mean, that's about all I know, though. <laughs> but I know that that post is closer than that building, it's closer than that tree. There's, there's no question that I know that. So to say that I don't know that is crazy. I, I that's, that's the whole fundamental thing. I think I, I'm just going to react very negatively to that. If you want to say that when I'm trying to, Recognize something. I'm not using that piece of information. It's fine. Um, let's say I don't know what the distance of these things. But the, the idea that you're doing that with grid cells implies that you know very precisely where that. Well, grid cells aren't precise. Distance. They're not very precise at all. But I, the fact that I have a representation of distance, which I do, that's there's clearly a representation of distance. Now I mean, you might argue maybe we're using some other cells for that. Right now, grid cells uh, could is a good guess for that, but. But to say I don't have a representation of that, I think is, I just can't, I can't accept that. 
I, by, that, by the fact that I know how far away these things are, relatively and in, in some scale, I, I, I do know it. That's the, that's the crux of the whole thing here. So um, I guess I'm just, I, I can't accept when you say those words, if you wanted to say I'm not using that information to infer the word Fox on the Fox Theater, okay, I'll, I mean, I'll accept that. There's a separate thing, how far away is it from my ability to recognize? But say I don't know that that word Fox is that, well, I'll, you know, it's probably 100 yards from here, I'll, I can't believe that, I do know it. It's right there, I know I'm not right for it. <laughs> so, um, so to separate those two things out, which I thought you agreed to earlier, but you know, I'm not sure you are. Um, um, I, I just think it's wrong to say I don't know how far from you. Uh, but I could also agree to you saying, hey, when I want to recognize the word Fox, I'm not calculating it based on the distance. I'm not using that distance metric. Figure that out. Well, I can. That might be right, um, but I can't. But I do know how far away it is, and I don't know how you can argue otherwise. I I would guess that you know that something is is it nearby, is it medium distance, is it far away? Okay, Fox is far away, and I can tell by the things around the Fox Theater, like the relative arrangement of those things. So I have a vague idea of the distance, but. It's a pretty good idea. I mean, this is not, I'm not sitting here sort of like fuzzy guessing how far away it is. Like it's, like, you know, it. yeah. it's not like it's precise. Obviously, grid cells aren't precise, but it's pretty damn good. I mean, I have a, a fairly high uh, resolution here. You could take that, you could take that, uh, take an object like that, that clock on the street there. Okay, so I have a model of that clock. I know, um, I know it's general size. Um, it's, I mean, I, it's not a relative size. I know I shouldn't know it's absolute size. I've been that next to it. And uh, if you showed that to me in different different positions all by itself, I could tell you how far away it is. I would know that. Um, I don't see why you have to abandon that idea. I, you know, there's a, there's a, I think there's some good insights here, but I don't know why you want to abandon the idea that I know how far away something is. It's unnecessary. Well, um, let me, I mean, let me just put a spin on. Can I erase this? Yeah, you can erase that. Um, what I, I've constantly battled with this same issue you're talking about, Marcus. But I mean, I first did it with the melody thing, right? And 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 they'll start with that because it's where I did a long time ago. Um, you've got you 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 actually remember the you remember the app you remember the absolute pitch of 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 the melody. Um, but you can recognize it, you can infer it at other pitches, at other scales, other, other keys, if you will. Um, the same with tempo. You remember the absolute tempo and um, absolute, and you can infer it at different tempos. When you say you remember it, does that mean like if, you, if you're asked to sing it back uh, day after day after day after day, that'll form like the mean of the mean of all your guesses are going to be correct. No, no, it means that when you've learned a song from like you heard a performer singing, like not not all the different ones you've heard. Like don't take a, just take a, some song some artist comes out with, and you've heard it now. You've heard that recording. It's it's a fact that you you actually although you can play it back at any key and you'll recognize it at any key, you actually memorize the actual key attempt. And you, that's in your head. That's, that was if, if it was someone were to play it back to me at another key, I would know. It that's that the that's the easy part though. But if you ask someone to go like sing "Hard Day's Night" or something, they will probably not. Well, it, again, it right depends key. on. on you know, pretty, I mean, you may not, you won't be exact. There'll be an error, right. but you know, roughly, you, you know, roughly what. So what, what spins on it? First of all, if you've heard the song played by lots of different covers, then you've got a lot of different things. Fine, right? yeah. Well, that's important. It's a very important thing. So. If you said uh, Mary had a little lamb, well, you might have heard that in a gazillion of the keys, you don't have a memory. If, if, if you're taking Hard Day's Night from the Beatles or something, and that's how you heard it, there, it's been shown that if, if most people, they say, do you know what key it's in? They'll say, no, do you know what note it begins? No, it's a sing it back. They'll sing it back almost always on the right key. So that was in uh, Levinson's book, or Levinson's like, conversation I had with that. Was Levinson? You got a book, uh, This Is Your Brain on Music? What his name was. Anyway, so so I take these effects. You remember the absolute pitch, although you may not even be able to tell me what it is. But if you play it back, you're more likely to do that. Of course, if you've heard it in lots of different keys, then it gets muddled. Um, the same thing with tempo. You you almost always play it back at the right tempo, but you can hear it at different tempos. Um, and so then we have the same issue with something like a physical object, like a coffee cup, all right? 
um, I have my Nomantic coffee cup, and I remember it at a particular size. Um, it, I remember it's absolute size. I know how big that is. I can just, I can tell you right now that it's about that tall, it's about that high, you know, I know the handle like this big, you know. So, but also I can, I can infer coffee cups, including my own, at different sizes. Um, and so there's some ability to say, well, how am I doing that, right? So, and I can do the same thing with cars or buildings or anything else. So we have, uh, we have these sort of two identities here. We have the, we have sometimes we remember particular object sizes and then we can infer different sizes. And sometimes we can remember an object by just saying generic coffee cup. This would be like the romantic coffee cup. If I just said a generic coffee cup, well, um, then I can't do that, right? Um, then I don't have, there's no absolute size. Um, right, even there, I could give you a guess. I, maybe, but I, mean, I, I know it's not going to be this. I can thing, think of, right? I, yeah, that's right. I can think of lots of little ones. Like, oh, you know, all these little cups from Europe, they're yeah. things like this, and the one my grandmother had. I can, you know, I can imagine all these different ones. I, I can think of all the ones in my house. I have like a dozen different types of teacups in my house. Um, but in a general way, so, but the point is we can infer an object I've never seen before, a different size, that, hey, that's similar to, that's the same basic structure, that's what you're arguing, you know, the same basic structure, basic relative positions and sizes of things, um, even though it's different. So, to me, it seems like we've got, we've got these two representations of everything. It's like, somehow I have, and this always, and the melody on me, it always bothered the heck out of me, that we never really solved this problem. We had a solution for this problem, the tempo problem. Um, and then we are also dealing with the problem here, and we never really solved this quite right here either. But uh, I've suggested before that we have to, we should just accept the fact that we can do these things. And so when, when we came up with the uh, uh, displacement cells, I thought that was, as, as I've said many times, I think the displacement cells was like, well, that's a good solution here because somehow the displacement cells are representing the, the um, um, they're representing the, the, the the, the, you could say it's it's I don't want to say it's the relative position. It's the it's the it's kind of like the displacement. It's kind of like a relative position, um, but uh, but it's something I can scale up and scale down. Um, it's it's independent of the specific instance. Um, so uh, like like it would be it would solve the problem of the absolute pitch in music. That's why. I, but I was thought about it. So anyways, the question is, can we, do we have two representations, right? Do we have sometimes, you know, when we remember something, do we remember, do we remember a specific object that a specific representation? And we also do remember sort of its, 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 uh, its, its relative position type of thing. And I would, I would think that's the right answer. I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's both. You, 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 know, you, you do both of those. And uh, sometimes you, you rely almost completely on the absolute memory. And sometimes uh, the other thing, and then and they, and complex, com making this more complex, is, is this idea that um, uh, if you do, if you have an object you recognize, you memorize it at some absolute scale, and then you're going to recognize it at a different scale, whether it's because it's far away from me or because I've taken the coffee cup and shrunk it down or something like that, um, then I, I think the idea that this this idea that you have the scale factor through the thalamus helps that greatly. So I can take an absolute object and uh, recognize it at different scales. Um, uh, and as soon as you, if you use a thalamic, thalamic mechanism for that, then, then you just, you basically, if you scale it down, your eye movements move less or move more, it's all, the, it's basically, it's the same model. It says, you know, you, you have to move your finger this amount to do something, now you don't have to move it that much, but you, the motor command's the same, and uh, it just gets, the thalamus is just scaling all the movements, it's scaling all the time. So, um, so you can you can uh, you, you, I can take an absolute model of a coffee cup and manipulate it at a different scale uh, and recognize it at a different scale just by changing the the, the holomic scale factor of everything. And then the brain uses the same memories. It can use the absolute memory and run it at a different scale. So I don't know. I just I'm trying to I, I'm, Today. I'm rejecting. I, I think the task that you're asking is a good one, which is how does I recognize something at distances and. And in your intuitions, I'm not looking at each, if I'm looking at the Fox logo over there, I'm not trying to calculate the letters to my head between the F and the O and the X simultaneously, you know, independently, perhaps. Um, so I think it's a good intuition, but I don't, I just can't accept the fact that you're saying that there's no, you know, there's no, um, 
absolute knowledge about the size of things or the distance from it. I think there is. So I, I think you have to figure, I, I'm going to push you to try to think about both representations or at least acknowledge that they are and say, okay, here's how I'm going to parse them out in different places. Um, anyway, I, it seems to me that the solution in here is going to somehow understand how you do both absolute and relative, absolute, relative, absolute, relative. Um, and maybe you need both those representations in it. And, and maybe this is just a, a small point, but like I'm still really surprised that you push so hard on this, that the remembering an absolute pitch. Like anyone with a background of like being in choirs or whatever with groups knows that it is a very novel skill if you can remember the absolute no, pitch. No, no, it's not actually. See, I, I, I spend a lot of time in choirs, but I've been a lot of music. I thought so too, and, 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 but it turned out not to be the case. It's one thing to be able to. Um, to uh, to be certain about it and to uh, be able to like say you know sing the F you know perfect pitch. Um, what but what was shown even people who say I have no idea what what key this is in you ask them to sing this song and they sing it in the correct key. So it's you have to separate out what the model the knowledge is from you know to what they think they know from um, what they actually know. So even. It just you know it's an average everyday kind of person does that. It's it's much much higher than um, than than chance. It's, it's like, yeah, uh, I would expect it to be much better than chance. It's gonna be, I would expect it to be like a Gaussian around correct, uh, but with a fairly wide standard deviation. Uh, well, we could get, we could try to find that. But uh, my conversation with that guy basically says, "Oh, it's surprising people don't even remember this. They just don't think they do." <laughs> so, like I don't I don't have perfect pitch. But then, but I tested myself on this. I've taken songs and I just said, okay, here's some song I know from some album or something. And I sing it and I turn it on. It's well, most of the time I got it right. It's just, you just for, for me, like I've had a couple times in my life where there was a song where I could do that. And I was like, wow, I can't believe but it. But you can't remember, like, if you're in a choir, you're singing a cover song. Right, you've heard that song in other keys. I'm talking about things like on, on a CD, like a, like a, like an actual popular song. Anyway, the, I, I, sorry, this I, I didn't make this up. That was okay. whatever that author's name was. He told me this, and uh, he's a speaker. So, um, but the, so the, the the distinction though is kind of like it. It is a good example to bring up because there are two ways of approaching all of this. One is that you remember sort of a particular instance of an object or particular size of an object, and then you can infer them. You remember a particular uh, instance of the song, and then you can infer it. It's the right thing to bring up. Whereas, like I, whereas I could see it also being you you learn like a um, scale invariant model of an object, and then on top of that system, you learn instances that plug in the, the actual size. Well, yeah, that. but it seems it doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to be you're doing both because um, again. If you take the coffee cup examples, right? Well, I, I agree that I have sort of a, a model of invariant coffee cups and I can see them in different sizes. But any particular coffee cup, I know exactly where it is. So, and I have a lot of those. It's, it's, so um, it doesn't feel like, oh, I just, I, it doesn't, I could be, but it, it doesn't feel like I have some separate knowledge about the size of the method coffee cup versus the size of the, the one that at my house. Uh, um, it seems like, in, well, I like to be careful because. It just seemed like boy, it, it, the entire I have this entire memory of how to manipulate the cup that's physical, and am I going to calculate the relative movements every time I do that? It seems like a, it's sort of like the same with the melody. It's like you're going to remember you can you can do that, you can scale it, but it seems like it would be a default scale. Uh, there'd be the, the the first scale you learned to that. So maybe maybe that's what you're saying. Let's say I learned the melody and only in the displacement cells. Um, but then there is a default scale. The default scale would be that it's like the normal rhythm of the thumbs. It would be like the default, let's say, the second scale being thumbs. It would be the normal uh, the default frequency of the set thumbs. Um, then I would agree with you. If you were accept, if you'd accept that idea, then I would say, okay, fine. So the, 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 the coffee cups model is a bunch of displacements and variants, but it's, it's in, integral to it is the normal uh, scaling of the thumbs. And so then, I, then it would be like you said. Then it would be like a separate thing, but it's not stored separately. It's just it's just that that's you learned it. Imagine I have a clock. There's a world clock, 
and I've learned everything relative to this world clock, right? I've learned everything relative to a meter stick. And now, um, so I, in some sense, I've, I've stored it in meters in this, but now I can just change the size of the meter, or I can change how fast the clock runs. Um, so it's, it's kind of in between. It's not like I have a, the knowledge is completely independent of the size of time. It's based on certain clocks and certain, and certain sizes, but I can change that. So if you want to call the, the size of a meter as the, the definition of the object, uh, size, I, I agree with you that. Yeah, I, you, I like that you have pulling prototype, uh, your prior for an object scales based on you know, all the experiences with objects like that, that you uh, experienced before, but then you can in, you can immediately correct the scale as soon as you generate a prediction. You know, you, you plant a saccade or you move your finger in a particular direction, and you overshoot, and you realize that in fact this thing is smaller than the prototype that you've got. When you say a prototype, are you thinking sort of the generic object? The meter stick. Yeah. Oh, the meter stick. That's, meter that's stick an absolute thing. Yeah, that's an absolute, you mean you have, you, you, you're trying to do it at the end of absolute memorized size. Sorry, maybe the, the typical coffee cup. Um, so you've got, you, you see a coffee cup and you assume that it's the prototype. You assume that it's the meant to coffee cup yeah. you spend so much time with. And then you plant a motor command and you reach for the handle and you overshoot it. You instantly realize there, there's a scale mismatch and you're going to have to adjust the scale factor. Yeah. And there's probably some sort of EM like expectation maximization going on, and then you adjust, and then the next motor command, you're going to hit the right spot, and you've got the scale chart. So let's let's expand that a little bit. Let's say I have a range of all the coffee cups in my life here, and they're different in lots of ways. They're not just just they're not just scale differences. They start shapes, and jump, colors, whatever. And I recognize all of those very quickly. Um, I would argue that we save each one of those at its, you know each one at its proper scale. It's not like I have a generic one and I'm and morphing into these different ones. It's like, oh, that one's a little fluted, this is the one that's green, this is the one that has the funny bottom. Um, and each one is going to be, I'm going to argue each one is memorized at, at the same meter state, if you will. Um, where the, where the, the morphing comes into play is if I see that particular object, like this one, shrunken down or bigger, or if I see a, um, I don't know what would happen if I see a new thing. Um, um, you know, if I, if I say a new thing I've never seen before, maybe I've seen the TV look up. Well, it looks kind of like one of the ones that you have, but it's not. Uh, yeah, I guess the question is, um, what happens in that case? Do I? If maybe that's what you're saying. It's like, hey, it's closest to one of the ones I've already seen, and, and I'm just now scaling it. Uh, something like that. Yeah. I think scaling is going to come from motor actions and prediction errors that yeah. come from. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, I agree that that's uh, that you do adjust that way. Although it's funny because you know it seems to me like when if I I, I was hoping to get to this Marcus, where like I, I if I look at something really quick like a flash inference of the sign across the street, I don't have time to do seconds. Mm -hmm. So the question there is. Okay, when I first sketched this, all I did it without saccades, then I decided it would be better to present the saccade version here. Okay. So, so anyway. Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, because once you're doing the saccades, now you're actually figuring out how much to move the eye. Yeah. Right, and then you're back into the scale issue, and now, and if I know how far away the box theater is, then I know how much. Then I just naturally could just scale it. Um, um, you know, but in that case, we have multiple columns collaborating. Well, the question is. So it's not that different from doing a saccade. No, but I'm right, saying, I, so I, I, well, well, if I, if how does that, I'm talking about, I was just talking about the, with the saccade, but if I don't have the saccade, how does that work? I mean, I have multiple columns. But yeah, okay. so if I, if I, let's start with, if I did have a saccade, I could go from here to here, yeah. and I would get some sensor. Yeah. If I don't have a saccade, I have a portable column there, and I know how far away these portable columns are. But how so I, know, I have exact, I, I can predict exactly what information I were to, would have gotten, yeah, yeah, but how do I how do I, how do I how do I how do I how do I get the scale from that? Um, for example, I mean, how would you get the scale from the saccade? Well, the same, well, the same Jeremy, was argue, Jeremy was arguing a second ago, like, well, depending on how far I have to move, if I move, you know, if I have to move a little bit uh, less, then it means the object further, you know. Right. Away. So let's say half a degree versus one degree. Yeah. I have cortical columns half a degree away, and well, a cortical column. Well, how am I going to read out that? How am I going to read? Who's going to be able to tell me? Uh, I mean, they're all coming in parallel. They're all there. I know. So I have two. So we have to figure out how to accumulate. Two is on the right The exact same pattern runs a different scale, right? So yeah. Two the same pattern, different scales. Um, you know, our column voting idea says um, uh, it, it doesn't really deal with scaling like that. We haven't thought about scaling. Yeah. Like yeah. So how do I how do I deal with that scale issue there? How is it that I can I can say that if I have a, when I'm looking through a straw, how much I have to move? To get to the next column to that thing, 
But how is it that? Um, Wait, can I ask what do we what, are, what do we mean by scale here? Are we talking about looking from like one f to the x on Fox? No, we're not. We're talking about okay. uh, this uh, flash inference. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, looking at the Fox. Yeah. The, the, so imagine I'm like, just looking at the Fox to the logo sign, and I have two different scales marked on them. Okay. I need to be able to do flash scales. <laughs> what do you mean by scale here? The thing is, physically occupying twice as much with half as much space on my retina. Okay. That's what I mean by that. It's physically larger on the retina, physically smaller. Okay. It's on the retina, and it's physically larger, physically smaller. So uh, now each column is going to be. I'm trying to ask how that we haven't really ever walked through flash inference at dealing with that problem. I don't recall doing that. The, the cluster thing. The, yeah, the cluster is the closest one. And this that but the cluster thing wasn't that. That was involving the distance to my body, wasn't it? Not, uh, um, yeah. Which you don't want to do, and I'm sort of inclined with you on this particular task right. here, that um, So I could have written these instructions out differently, where, where I draw the same thing, except rather than moving, uh, I'm going to, like, I'm going to see this image. I'm going to, uh, like my flash inference. flash inference, my multiple cortical columns are gonna are gonna see this. Like suppose my visual field is kind of divided up into cortical columns, then uh, <laughs> just suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know why you drew them. It, it, it was slanted like that. I, I don't know. It was just because it wouldn't be slanted. Fine. Uh, it was, I was fitting them to the circle. Yeah, sort of. Uh, anyway, uh, so we're talking about like yeah, predict. Seeing this image um, should kind of well. Okay, here I'll, I'll say something, then I'll try to connect it back to this. Seeing this kind of causes uh, causes a prediction over here somehow. Uh, see, seeing this image in this part, this cortical column, ought to cause a prediction over here. Like yeah. we, we want, we want to predict yeah. the yeah. the other thing. Uh, it's hard for me to talk about scale on this. I mean, but you, but you well, predict point, a particular let's, image. Right, so you, let's, call that scale. let's say you just have your two things. You have your two little buildings, right? Or whatever you want, two little cylinders. Um, uh, I can't do it like this. Yeah. Um, your two little cylinders here. And, um, uh, and so, in some sense, let's say one color of column sees this, and one color of column sees this. Uh, but this one predict that, and this one predict this. Yeah. But but this, if everything zoomed up a bit, and this column here got this this part here got larger, then it would predict something out here. It wouldn't predict something here. It would predict something here. Right. And we don't we haven't dealt with that problem at all. We've just assumed in flash inference, everybody's learning some component. They all vote and we say, yeah, that's it. I know what this is. But we haven't been able to show how um, how you could add scale to that. How you could say uh, okay, at a bigger scale, the prediction, this guy's going to predict something over here, and, and, and you know, this, this guy's going to predict something down here, you know. We're, th right now, we have this sort of hard wire between, oh, you know, rectangle or, or small building, big building, this is their distance apart. Mm -hmm. And we haven't dealt with the scaling issue. This is, this is what they call, actually, I don't think we've ever really discussed this. Um, the, the idea of flash inference scaling. And I would say that all the pieces are here to solve that. Uh, and, and what I've drawn here, like that's kind of the problem I was solving in some sense. Well, no, but, but, but in flash inference, well, you're saying, oh, you're saying just, I, I didn't draw that version, but yes, the, the, uh, this you're variation. saying, um, uh, I, I, I don't know how this solves it. I mean, I think you're saying you're talking about the same things here, but in terms of the mechanism for doing this, I don't think you propose an answer to that. It's, it's like, um, you know, imagine I, 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 our voting system um, does not have a way of um, changing where the voting goes to or this, you know, it, 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 it doesn't, we don't have that. I don't know how you're, I know you're talking about the same thing, but I don't see how, how a mechanism that would do that. No, I, I'm Get, getting it down to a circuit level with a voting mechanism that, that's not here yet. It's, yeah. it's conceptually here, but it's not, uh, the, the pieces aren't figured out yet. I actually think this is, a, this is a, a, again, I'll say again, I think it was a big missing component. We never talked about this, at least 
not many, clear way. And um, I think it's a very important clue. We get to ask ourselves, how is it that I do flash inference at different scales? Which is like close to where you're going here, but you kept talking about the movement of the eyes and, and, and you talk about it, but you didn't actually talk about the voting mechanism and how columns could do that. So if you ask yourself how you could do that with columns, that would be very interesting. Um, how could it really physically be possible? And well, if you know the absolute sizes of things, then all the information is there to do it. Yeah, but how would I, how do I route it? I don't want to have any particular column. Um, okay, so what does the column need to know? The column, I mean, it's not like in the past, what is voting? We're voting on say object identity, right? We have to actually vote on pose too, I suppose. Um, so object identity and pose. And now we're saying, um, we well, posing to me incorporates distance. Also. Well, okay, I was thinking this orientation. This orientation. Uh, okay. You know, again, when I'm touching the coffee cup, the voting works really well because um, because it's, this is a non-scaled object, and your fingers are right on the object. So, but and it, when it comes to this this the flash inference from vision. Um, we never really got the vision working correctly in the system, and, and now we're saying, hey, this is another problem with the vision one. Yeah, I, I, don't, I know the information's there, but how is it that the neurons do it? You know, how do they vote? To, how, how does one column predict what it's going to see? Uh, how do they reinforce each other? It's almost like saying that a column has to, a column has to know, um, it has to be agreed upon scale. I just have to get this call out here. Do you think the cost idea solves this, Marcus? Uh, I don't have a good answer to that right now. I thought the classroom involved uh, basically calculating where I am relative to something. It does. And you didn't want to do that here at all. So, so um, uh, like, what we can definitely have. have uh, and anything I'm going to say is just a variation on this, but the idea that you have like the, you know this big retinotopic map and like what you see here causes a, a vote over here, um, it's a tractable problem. But I don't have uh, I don't have right, what I have right now is like pretty high confidence that the solution exists. Uh, well, I'm not worried about finding, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I I just don't. I, I don't feel like I'm trying to solve the wrong problem right now, but by thinking that I can find a solution, that's, that's going to be something. Well, it's, it's conflicting with our voting solution right now. So our voting solution right now doesn't do that. And um, to just uh, naively extend our voting system leads to a combinatorial explosion problem. Because um, then every column has to be able to predict its activity based on input from anywhere else at any uh, scale and orientation and so on. Um, um, all right. Well, I don't think we have to solve this problem today, but I think now I'm going to add that to the list of problems we have to solve. But I think that's a big clue. We never, we got again, we, we, this whole theory came about from touch. In touch, we don't have these issues. It feels like we don't have these issues of uh, sensing at a distance. And as I argued recently, a few weeks ago or a month ago, I argued that actual touch is sensing at a distance. It's just an extreme version of it. Um, so uh, I think this problem exists. Um, this is a generic problem for flash inference at scale. Uh, it's a problem. Um, I'm not sure if the cost of my idea solves it. Or not. Feels like it. I can see how the columns could be voting on scale. Each column could be saying, "I'm recognizing something," and there's a hypothesis of what I'm recognizing, and, uh, and it's a hypothesis of the scale. And so all the columns could be making a hypothesis of scale, and uh, and then saying, okay, well let's let's try this scale. You know, this is the winning scale. Um, but the thalamus, if they're all projecting back to the thalamus, if the, oh, every bunch of V one is projecting back to LGN, and so LGN is going to pick one scale. Can't pick multiple scales. They don't have a million scales in LGN. It's just there's one frequency. So you're going to pick the right one. You're going to pick one and see if it works. So you, I can see how they can all vote on scale. That would work. Um, but then I would see how an individual column could say, 
um, what should I predict based on what you're what you're seeing and scale? How would I know what I'm supposed to predict? Um, I think the answer is there. I just we haven't thought through the question deeply. Mm -hmm. So we can vote on scale. That's that was something that would work easily. And the cost of idea is voting on locations or, or relative locations. Or how would you phrase that? Uh, the first way I'd phrase it, just because I'm used to thinking in this way, is uh, where is the viewer, where is the retina in the reference frame of the composite object? And all of the components are sort of contributing to that. Where is the viewer relative to this component? Where is the viewer relative to this component? They're voting on where is the viewer relative to a parent. Mm -hmm. That's my first answer. I might be able to phrase that differently if I think about it. Yeah, I trouble that a little bit. All the words make sense, but the concept is a little. It's it, it or it's equivalent to like how um, Jeff Hinton will use the example with. Um, you see an eye, and that votes for the idea that there is a face right here. And you see this uh, another part, another part of your visual cortex sees this eye, and it votes for the idea that there's a face right here. So you're you're kind of voting on the apparent object at a pose. But only to know the scale of the eye. Without a scale, it doesn't know where to put the face. That needs to be scale aware. You don't, you don't have the scale of the eye, you don't know where to put the nose. Oh. So you need to build a book. You need to be scale aware on the picture. Yeah. So let's see the things that uh, you can vote on here. Uh, well, we, we, we've talked about voting, of course. Oops. Just thinking, why is this one getting so dark? Um, we've talked, not that this is right, but we've talked about voting on object ID. Uh, we can talk about um, voting on scale. That would be to the thalamus. We propose this through some long range con uh, connections. Quite a rule. Um, uh, this is just distance. That's all it is. It's just, it's just like how far away it is, how close to this type of thing. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't tell you anything about the pose of the object, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and is it, would it be worth writing the word pose here? Would that be the right well, word? Well, we have, we've rarely talked about just voting on pose by itself. But we've, it's missing here. Sure. So like in the past, with the classroom idea, uh, classroom idea, that was object ID at pose. Object at pose. Um, it was a specific object at a specific pose. Well, again, when we talk about pose, I'm very careful here. Are we talking about just the orientation or the orientation and distance? Orientation and distance. Orientation and Location, uh, uh, yeah, it's the it's it's six dimensional. It's it's where is it relative to me, and what is its orient orientation? It, it feels really strong to me that scale is represented separately. It's the thalamic thing. Um, so pose would include scale because it includes how where its distance from me is. Uh, um, that starts to get blurry. Uh, okay. Right, wouldn't it? I mean, it's to me scale is just basically. How far away something is, or um... so. It, one way to think of it all would be like, okay, uh, here's an eraser um, at a particular pose. Uh, so it, it's right here. Now, if I were to change its scale, it would get larger and smaller, but it would still be right here. Uh, so the scale is. So the scale, scale is a totally okay. separate so, variable. That well, but see, so I'm not including it that way. I'm okay. including, uh, well, it couldn't put it that way. We could go either way. You, you're right, we could go either way. I'm, yeah. so I'm, I'm, here I've sort of gone the other way with when I'm talking the premise of this presentation, mm. but I'm still figuring out how to integrate all this. It seems, I mean, as much trouble as I gave you earlier, it seems to me when I recognize the Fox logo across the street, I am recognizing the Fox logo is a separate ID or uh, uh, idea than how far away it is. I know how far, what I'm saying, I know how far away it is, yeah. but recognizing it is independent of that. And I think, and that's why I kept trying to push you in the direction to say, yes, I recognize how far away it is, but in the recognizing, I know how far away it is, 
but that's not, I'm not using that information necessarily for recognizing the object. Um, but it's hard to separate all those things out. Um, um, if we want to think about scale, if we think about the coffee cups, you could say one form of scale is, ah, oh shit, I want to be careful here. I get, the Thalak idea is a really, really nice idea. It basically says, I can take a model and I can move relative to that model uh, based on my distance from it. And that can apply to the standard size coffee cup uh, being different distances from my eye, my move my eye less or more. But it could also apply, apply to the, the shrunken down version of the coffee cup and moving my fingers less or more. And I'm not sure if it's the same thing or not. Um, it might be a different thing. Um, but those are two different types of scales. And I think just related to what you said, one is like, hey, this is the same object but it's in different positions. And the other is no, it's a shrunken down a version, you know, larger version of the object. Mm -hmm. um, the same, it seems like such a, a useful mechanism you'd like to be able to do both of it. Um, it just seems, if I'm on a column of the cortex over here, and I'm trying to, um, I'm looking at other people's votes, and I want to make, I want to settle on something. It seems I have to include all this all this information to make my you know. Um, just that's just a weird. Uh, I have to know like where the, all these other things are relative to me, so scaling them in and out to make that prediction. It's a really bizarre concept. So who like hierarchy? Is a critical part of the answer for this problem. It seems like we have this uh, concept of displacement cells for these, uh, and you know how, how much displacement there is between these two objects. Yeah. Maybe within a single column of a particular object, there's compositionality there as well. There's still sub objects within it. So we have some notion of hierarchy below that single object. That, that hierarchy below can also produce a displacement. So it's able to understand that with this, this subject, this, this sub object, there's some displacement that is implied by, you know, the base is a little bit, is like one degree of saccade away from the top. And that displacement vector can then be taken up to a higher level of hierarchy. And that same exact scalar value, which is like a multiplier on the, the total scale of the composition as a whole, can then be used to make predictions about the macro object as well. It's possible, but then you're still, you're still incorporating movement, right? Um, I think... I don't, yeah, I don't think it needs to. I think... We, well, you said saccade, so... Uh, yeah. Uh, so what we don't think about saccade, but just like degrees of like potential saccade, like degrees of visual shifts. We don't actually have to take the motor action. We're just looking for a, a scale factor, and each of the sub objects is actually going to be able to generate uh, a vote for what that scale factor is based on the displacements that we see from from flash inference from the static displacements. Mm -hmm. Static displacement both within the sub object as well as the Getting lost. The, what's the word when you're using the word displacement right now? Are you talking about like how far away the components are on the retina, or I'm thinking of everything in um, in like in motor coordinates, so like angles, because I think that's the thing that's easiest to make invariant. So the sub objects, let's say the sub sub object is composed of well, yeah. So in this example, we have two objects, right? And so this one is some tower. <laughs> what if this sub object was just uh, just two dots like this? Um, and so the sub object is, is going to be, we're going to have some hierarchy below this thing. You say hierarchy, you're talking about physical hierarchy in the brain? Uh, um, like we have a bunch of columns here. Yeah. We have some columns here that feed so it. It's like spatial pooling. Yeah. 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 And, and the uh, so this hierarchy down here is going to be is going to generate some uh, angle, this which is like an this, this this region. Or what I mean is hierarchy. This maybe like a column in this lower level is uh, detecting how, this object. How is it going to do that? Because it's one dot here, one dot here. It's two different columns. Are you saying there's column? no, they're, so they're the same column uh, at this level? Same as L two, and then this is L one. Okay. Yeah. So we're able to detect this. We're able to detect not what down the, up, not down L one. You can't detect. You have to, you can only detect it in the, right? Why can't you detect the displacement well, between? Who's going to detect it? you got two different columns. Who's calculating the angle? 
Um, I mean, it's there, the information's there, but it doesn't mean anybody can read it out. Um, here's a, a kind of, I'm going to propose a completely different way of thinking about it. So, if you, you haven't been here, this is, and every time I've always pushed back against thinking about the hierarchy, I've come to believe that the entire answer to all this stuff is you focus on a single column at once. <laughs> and because the answer is in a column, uh, because a single column can do almost everything. A single column, in theory, it's like looking through that little straw. It's like you can move around and you can sense one thing at a time. And also, uh, and, it, and you can never really, I'm not saying the hierarchy is not important that we don't use it, but I've always tried to resist to be blind enough to anything to be absolutely certain we can't have to. So I would like to ask the question, how can a single column um, solve a problem? Now, a single column cannot look at the whole image at once, right? So if I only have a single column, a single column can look at something and say, oh, I see the, I see the small cylinder, and, 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 and then I'm going to go and move and see something else. And, and through this process of moving around, you eliminate the possibilities that you have a hypothesis of what you might see, and then you say, oh, this might be this, this two-building structure, and if it is, I should move this way, and then I'll see a bigger one. Um, and um, so in, in, a, in a single column too, you could say the thing I'm looking at is different scales, uh, and therefore I should move further or not. Um, I, I guess I'm, 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 I don't want to shut down your line of thought, but my way of thinking about this would not be to rely on hierarchy. It would be to start off by thinking about a single column and a single level, ask how that solves these problems, and then expand that to how they vote to solve the problem, and then you expand that to how you get to hierarchy. So again, don't, I don't want to tell you can't do yeah. what you're thinking about, but that's right, I understand. I think that methodology makes uh, sense. But, but so in your view, does a column a column can't uh, see this this sub object with both of its? Oh, I don't know. I'm just saying a column can see something. Imagine I, it just you know like a column can see something, and and by moving around a little bit, it, it, a single column can only see a little bit, right? And I'm not saying a single column can recognize large things, but the single column can recognize structure by moving around. And a, and a level two column is looking at a bigger area, and a level one column is looking at a smaller area. So a level two column would be better at looking at bigger things, a level one column would be looking at smaller things. But the the, the solution somehow is that if I, I have to be able to get this, I have to be able to solve all these problems with a single um, a single column in some sense. A uh, single column has to be able to learn a logo or something, and, and it should solve all of these problems. Um, um, and then once you understand how that works, then you can go back and say, oh, well, how does flash inference work? That's how we came up with the, that's how we came up with that idea. A single column can, can move around and experience and, and learn the structure of the world's movement. And then we said, well, okay, now I have a whole bunch of columns. How do they how do they vote together? Um, so if I think about it that way, then a single column has to represent all the things we talked about. It has to represent the object ID, it has to represent a scale in the in Marcus's concept. It has to represent pose, which is the distance and the orientation. All that would have to be represented in a single column. Um, and um, yeah, that's where we have to start. <laughs> uh, well, Marcus, you did say you wanted to just start the conversation today. Yeah. I guess I'm not uh, well, one mini thing that we've talked about before that's kind of just separate from all of this that I think is a useful uh, thing to bring in. I'm fond of the idea. And you might have first, um, I forget, it was you were talking to someone, it might have been Mount Castle, it might have been Murray Sherman or something. But the idea that, um, okay, cortical columns, we talk about them like they're these discrete things. Uh, but sometimes it might be useful to think of. Um, cortical columns are it, it's, it's all kind of this continuous field, this continuous um, um, whatever, and um, the image that comes into the retina sort of determines where the cortical columns are. The, the boundaries between cortical columns are not these strict things. If this cylinder lands right here versus if it lands like a millimeter over or something like that, Functionally, it's almost like cortical columns appear where they need to appear. It, it's almost like, am I, am I making sense? Do I sound Yeah, 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 no, that was an issue. And then remember, we talked about how non-castle's views of this changed over the years. Okay. Uh, he had both opinions. I think in his original essay, he said they, were, they could be dynamic. And then later, he, he argued they weren't. And the evidence for the reason they weren't dynamic was he, um, I forget, there was some, I'm not sure what, 
which which papers or books he wrote this in, but he gave a lot of evidence um, that it was some paper we read it or I read it, I don't know, but where he gave different different sensory modalities that as you he was arguing that the uh, there was a, a there was always like some sort of discontinuity uh, that you'd run into when you're going horizontally to the cortex. So mm -hmm. you get you know representations for one part of the skin, and then immediately jumps to the next part yep. of the skin, and immediately jumps to the next part of the skin. And but he did that. Well, he did that not just in somatosensory cortex. He did that. Uh, he gave evidence in lots of different areas of cortex that that was the case. So he would, he ended up in the end, I believe, believing that they were more they were discrete. Okay. They would vary in size. There's no question about that. Uh, they could be different, larger and smaller. The larger as you go up the hierarchy, um, but um, but anyway, we don't know the answer to the question. But Malkessel started out dynamic, and I think he ended up in flight, so he could go more discreet. Mm -hmm. The dynamic one is appealing for theoretical reasons, but it's, I mean, it's interesting. I find it confusing because uh, it, it's I, weird. But it would I, be, I don't it, think about it. It's it would like, be nice if, if it'd be nice if. There, um, this so okay. Wait, this is a drawing of a column. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it'd be nice if you could always bet on the idea that this appears on the whole thing appears in some. Yeah, the, 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 there is some cortical column who is kind of centered on this object, and there's some cortical column who is centered on this one. You know, well, you don't have to deal with it shifting. Well, okay, so I think there's two questions here is a column, is it, is it fluid across the cortex, or are the receptive fields overlapping? That's a separate question. Because if you had overlapping receptive fields, then you might say there's always a, a column that's centered on that object. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that it's dynamically sized. Um, right? It could be just, oh yeah, this, this column really represents it correctly, and this one just, sort of just catches the edge of it, and this one catches none of it or something like that. The other point of biological complexity that I think is useful to think about and eventually useful for, for this as well is that these saccades are not fixed. It's not like saccade here, saccade here. At every saccade look at every fixation, you have constant motion. You mean, I mean the micro saccades? Yeah, the micro saccades. Yeah. I mean, the actual data that's coming to the retina is constantly in flux. Yeah. And that's yeah. beneficial for flash inference potentially. So we have motion there as well. Yeah, I, could, I think we looked at this much, but maybe not. There's a question is if you flash an image shorter than a micro saccade, then you can't take advantage of it. I didn't. I thought that it was continuous. I didn't realize the micro saccade was. Uh, uh, was well, well. Uh, what it does is it. Yeah, if you look at the fixation point, it kind of it's kind of it wanders wanders away and then it jumps back, and it wanders away and it jumps back. So the wander, I think, is potentially then it's. it's yeah, you're right. The wandering would start right away. Um, I feel like Bruno shows these videos of uh, the images. Yeah, they've been talking about that recently. Like yeah. That. yeah, and that's beneficial because those are not so common, but that's motion that we can use for predictions or. Well, this spot, it is true. Uh, you could all even, even slight motion like that can be used to determine distance. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's just a direct readout. If you're assuming that the object you're looking at is static, and now you watch how far it moves yes. over the course of a you know few milliseconds. I think that's what I was hoping, maybe not explaining well, but hoping to get at with this idea, like the column is able to detect displacement in the image and to detect some sort of motor scale from that. I think you get you scale from that. I don't think you get anything else from that. But scale is all you need. Uh, well, it's one of the things you need. I mean, we need to get pose and orientation, all these yeah. things, you know. Um, I'm a little confused. You're saying saccading can help get distances. Not saccading, micro saccades. Mi micro saccades. Either even that. How can that help? Because it, because it, well, it, uh, it, as the eye drifts at a certain rate, it's it's it, so assuming the micro saccade is that always at the same rate of drift. It, it drifts at a constant rate. Therefore, okay. how 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 much the image moves on the retina during that. How does that, if, if the image is a, if, if the mountain is a mile away or inches away, so how does that vary? I'm looking at a dot, and if the dot's right in front of my eyes, then a microsecond will look much further on the retina than it's further away. I think you actually have to make head movements for that to occur. Yeah. No, it's just, it's just the, the, the image on the retina is moving. The microsecond yeah, pushes it. It makes it very clear. I saw, I saw so, the, so the image on the retina is moving. Okay. It moves more the closer it is, it moves less the further away it is. If you know the size of the object ahead of time, right, then then the distance, how much it moves, no, 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 I will tell you. You don't need to know the size of the object. All you need to know is in any particular aspect of the object. It's it's just like imagine it's have a dot or an edge or anything. It doesn't really matter what it is. The you have to know the size because um, otherwise a bigger object. 
further away would move the same as a small object closer. Yeah, you hold so it. It's, it's for a given size object. You have different. No, if I, if you're thinking of the recognizing the entire object. I'm just saying, imagine there, there is no object recognition. It's it's just an edge. Imagine it's an edge on any object. It could be an edge on a coffee cup, an edge on a pen, or an edge on a mountain. And that edge is going to move. It's going to, it, it doesn't matter how big the object is. It's just the amount of movement. It just, I'm not looking at the size of the thing. I'm just looking at that edge, that one dot or that one edge. That's going to be changing depending on how far away you are. Oh, how? Oh. It's not a saccade, a micro saccade. Let's be careful. A saccade varies in its distance. This is just like a, a imagine just it's a drift. And it comes back and drifts, and comes back and drifts, and comes back and drifts. It's, it's just the, um, the location of where the, the phobia is landing in space. The farther away it is, and the more. Uh, Let's go that one. Just make a Just make it. Yeah, I'll throw it. So the object is this distance versus this distance, and the angle is the same because what the saccade, the micro saccades are doing is just changing this angle. There's a little delta on this angle. So the amount of distance here is going to be different than here, and then this one here. So they, the same angle is going to move this uh, this point. A different amount, right? I don't think Marcus can see you. Uh, I mean, I'll look at it. <laughs> don't, don't imagine you're not looking at an object, you're just looking at a, a feature which is causing a cell to become active. As the eye drifts, that feature is going to move on the retina. Sure. And the further away it is, the less it's going to move, the closer it is, the more it's going to move. So think of how much the, the uh, image landing on the retina is changing up it's, here. It's thing. always going to, if you, if you saccade over by not saccade, saccade, if you micro saccade, if you drift over by 0.5 degrees, the image is going to shift by 0.5 degrees, no, no matter how far away it is. Because this is the image here. And so this is the amount that's going to change from the same delta up here versus down here. The same object size, right? This is all the same object size. Look how much the delta is changing. I don't know if this is no, no, clear no, or not. No, it's more, I, don't like, I, think it's, I think the way to look at it, this, I'm, I would draw the opposite. I would say, uh, it's not like, it's not, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Uh, imagine you just have a, a dot here and a dot here and a dot here, right? And they're being projected onto the retina here. And now the retina moves, the, the eye moves a little bit. So now it's, it's um, let's see how I might do this. Uh, 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 oh, yeah, okay, here's the retina. And, and it's projected right here. Now the eye moves a little bit. So I just now, it's, it's like tilted like this, right? It, it's, it's like, so, um, uh, oh God, I'm not drawing right. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't take away from Jeremy. Um, you can you can imagine that. Imagine I imagine I just have an image on the on the retina, and um, uh, this is not a new idea. I didn't make this. Up. I think this is in the literature. Uh, um, I, I'm trying to figure why you feel one way and I feel the other way. Um, this is the ratio change, right? The ratio between data and how much you know, in the object that's yeah, in image coordinates, the amount of shift across the image is changing depending on the distance. So the same exact is going to produce a much larger delta of the image. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think this is this is actually a really simple way. I think we're just describing <laughs> it very, very poorly. Why are we disagreeing about it? I, I my I have something to learn here then. My mental model says if you saccade, micro saccade, any type of saccade by any number of degrees, every part of the image is going to move by precisely that number of degrees. I can see your point, but then it feels like it's wrong. Um, <laughs> that is not going to help, I don't think. Maybe it is the. Um, The image on the retina down here is part of a T, the image up here is AT, and the image up here is larger than AT. The same theta. So the delta of the image, call it delta X, it's going to be larger for, it's going to go with um, distance. But I argued that it, was, it wasn't the object itself. I was arguing it's just like any point in the, in the object, which might be wrong. Um, all that matters is that, in, that this is true. And if that's true, then um, you get a constant access to some notion of relative scale. Which yeah, is but, but, but Mark is arguing, he's saying, he's saying in, mechanistically from an optics point of view, I have a point of, point of light out in the distance, it's coming through a lens, 
if I move my lens point five degrees, it's going to move point five degrees on the you know on the other side. Um, yeah, that's true too. Yeah, but they're not inconsistent. Well, I think it, uh, it's inconsistent. What I said, I said it would work with just a dot or a line, but I don't think that's right. Yeah. It's, if you it's, know the size of for yeah. a given size object, the amount of move will depend on the distance. The size, but you really have to be knowing the size of the object. You have to know the size. You just hold it constant. It has to be constant. Yeah, constant. Yeah. For yeah. constant yeah. Size. But in order to tell the depth, you need to know the size. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But we're not going to care necessarily about the depth. What we care about is so that we can see the Why is difference. it? I mean, why is it? Okay. I mean, definitely, if you know this, if you know the size, if you know the actual size, then yes, then you can figure out the depth. But uh, that's that, that's kind of, that, that has nothing to do with the microscots. That's just any flash that would be true of. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's it's if you want to figure out the depth exactly, you have to know the size. If you don't know the size, but if you keep the size fixed, then the distance will depend on the depth, just like the you showed there. You're also true. You're also correct that for a given image, if you move 0.5 degrees, everything is going to shift 0.5 degrees. So that's also correct. I, I They're thinking, not inconsistent. I was thinking the other way around. That makes sense. I was thinking if something that moves an inch in the distance, I was wrong. I was thinking if something that moves an inch, well, it's far away, it moves less than the retina, and it's closer, it moves more than that. But that's that's not what's happening. It's the retina's moving. Right. Um, well, the object can move an inch in either way. So the object say, this, this thing is, I know this is an inch, and therefore. Um, if, if, you take the same, if you take the same object and move it twice as far away, 0.5 degree shift will give you two different views, two different. If, if an object is close to you and you move 0.5 degrees, you see a certain change in features. If it's really far away and you move 0.5 degrees, you see a different change in features coming into the same core column. Right, that's that equation. Not totally lost. I'm, so I'm just repeating what. Jeremy's. I, I know, but I'm just saying. So, can we determine distance from microsecads or no? You can determine absolute distance if you know the size of the object. But that has nothing to do with secads. That's uh, it, just no, but, but, I, we were saying only in the, the it, flash. It, I know it, it's not tied to secad, but given you have a secad. No, we're talking about if you, in this in this scenario, you would know the exact distance if you knew the size. The question of the was the question was when we're not doing a regular secad, we're doing flash inference. Could a microsecad play an important role in flash inference. So even though we say there's no saccade, it's a flash inference, it's a fixation. The point is, no, it's not, the eye's still moving. So is that part of the flash inference process? You get an instantaneous rate of change in flash inference, and that instantaneous rate of change is useful for inferring depth distance. There's some and in my art, and that's only true if you limit yourself to a single cortical column. But if you have multiple core to column, you don't really need this to cut because you have information. Coming but but the question is, but remember, yeah, but it's hard for the columns to vote on everything. So if every, if every column had could on its own sort of take a guess at the at the, the scale of the distance. Um, I'm so confused whether this actually works. <laughs> if I have a single column and I'm looking at something, whatever it is, uh, and I now move, I now drift a little bit. Um, how much the thing moves on your retina definitely goes for it proportionate to how far away it is. Is that what you're asking? Well, yeah, but I, but I argue that, but then Marcus' point seems true too. So I'm you're saying degrees. The degrees are the same, but we, are, we don't care about the degrees of the yeah. image. Yeah. Is there degrees? We have completely consistent statements. Well, I'm confused now. I'm confused. <laughs> if I look at it, I mean, if it's always going to move 0.5 degrees on the retina, what, I mean, what, what does that tell me? You don't measure the retina. The, the image doesn't change. Yeah, but the degrees. The image changes. So you have to, the, the feature that's available 0.5 degrees away is going to be dependent on the depth. Yes, it always moves 0.5 degrees, but the exact feature you get 0.5 degrees away. Well, you're saying am I getting a different feature? Yeah. I, I was, uh, just like in that well, I was arguing that the microsecad is not going to get a different feature. The microsecad is just going to take the same feature and just shift a little bit. Um, and that, no, no, it doesn't do that. That's, well, I mean, it, we don't take the image and shift it. We sh rotate our eyes. And so the actual yeah. feature that's coming in. No, but there. imagine it, imagine my, my receptive field of my column is a certain size and my microsecads are much smaller than that. So I'm not gonna like get a whole new thing. I forget what this rule of paper said. Did he say that you've got you got different activations, but was it like completely different receptive field areas? I don't remember his paper. 
Um, you should be mentioning this as like a grading, you know, like in a typical mouse study or something. A grading, uh, it's just rate of change at that point. That's all we're talking about. Yeah, but the grading has other ambiguities. But it's not a rate of change because it, is it right? There's another thing in here. Marcus's point is you're going to get the same rate of change no matter what. That's an easy thing. <laughs> the, the only possibility I can see is like, okay, this eye, this beam of light's coming in, it's seeing a particular edge or something like yes. that. Uh, Saccad, this beam Michael of light. Scott, thank you for the follow. You, you move the eye of I hate of I want to make sure the attention is small. So uh, now this, uh, there's a micro saccad of this eye. Yeah. And this beam is going to land somewhere else on the retina. Now, one weird thing is that confuses me a little bit is it's, you're not you're, when you turn your eye, you're not just going to rotate about this point. You're going to rotate about some point back here. Fine. So, so fine. You're, the actual yeah. pupil is moving. So, is that where the subtle difference comes? How do you move the object instead of the retina? Is the eyeball doesn't that seem easier? It should be so clear that the the amount of like delta y of the object is going to you're, oh, you're saying the rate of change on the retina is going to determine. It's yeah. not the yes. well, rate of change and what you see is the same. Well, imagine I imagine my I'm, I'm staying within my imagine I'm within my receptive field, so I'm, I'm still recognizing the same thing. But it's it's it, on the absolute uh, degrees is going to be the same, but it's the rate of change which would be different, isn't it? Correct. The further away it is, the faster it'll move on the retina. Yeah, the, and therefore. For no, the closer it is, the oh, closer it is, yeah. And therefore, for a fixed D theta, the, the the change in the image, the delta x, is going to be. But that's inconsistent with what Mark is saying. Mark is saying, and I can't see that. Mark is saying, if I move 0.5 degrees, everything's going to move 0.5 degrees. That's true. 0.5 degrees is the same. But we're not measuring on the, the image. Isn't measured in degrees. The image is measured in some sort of image coordinates. All right, I'm just a patch of retina, and I got some pattern. On it. You got pixels on you. Yeah, and now that pixel moves. I the eye does a micro saccade just a little bit, and um, the number of pixels to the right that it moves. Right. That's okay, right. so it moves the number of pixels to the right. Uh, Marcus's point is that that the degrees of movement are going to be the same around how far away the thing is. No, uh, that's not what he said. He said if I move well, he said if it moves point five degrees, everything's going to shift point five degrees, which is correct. Well, but what happens at the same at point five degrees on the retina, right? It's uh, um, the number of pixels is different for the same point five degrees, isn't that? Is that thing that makes these statements consistent? Say again. The point five degrees is the same, but the number of pixels that actually maps into the, the number of pixels to the right that the thing moved. But, but isn't the number of pixels on the retina right relative to the turning point of the eyeball going to be the same? I mean, it's like point five degrees is always going to be the same number of pixels. So that's Marcus's point. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, but if you take that same object and move it twice as far away. The images after you move 0.5 degrees will be different. No, they're different, but yeah, that, and that's that's but it's that not. Equation. It's not. I can't. I'm just. We're trying to just take and we de de determine distance by either a rate of movement or how far it moved. And the answer is no. I think um, we need to get a straw because I think <laughs> we should eliminate things. You're looking through a straw and you're looking at something really far away. So it's moving really fast. Okay, so it's moving so close. It's moving really slow, right? Uh, same object. No, it's not true. <laughs> the edge is not. The edge is, no, no. The whole uh, the whole object will be moving faster or slower, but not the edge. The edge will be moving faster too for the same delta theta. No, I think I'm with Marcus on this one. You know, it's because the, yes, the, the whole object is moving faster, but the edge itself. Like if I line my edge up with one of those, my finger edge of my finger, one of those little things. No, you're not with the same object. That's the problem. You're not moving with the object. No, it's, we're not talking about object. I'm not. I'm not recognizing object. I'm just trying to use some feature in the visual space to determine my distance. Okay, you just to keep that feature the same size as you move towards. Well, it's just, it, it's just an edge, let's say, or a dot, one pixel on. Well, I can't tell anything about it. It's just an edge. I can't tell anything about it. Um, if I say the whole object, if I know the size of the object and the object speed, yeah. But we were trying to determine um, distance without object. These eye rolls, that's what I was trying to do. I feel like this experiment works for me. If, if you were looking through a straw at this laptop uh, and you didn't know, is this a laptop that's like, you know, six feet away from you? Or is this a giant laptop over there, like in the town square? Uh, if you're not holding the object face. You have to hold no, no, these yeah. are the two possibilities. You want to distinguish between these. Is this a giant laptop or is this a small laptop? 
you're looking through a straw and you turn, how does that answer that question? Okay, I think there's a different problem. It does what I would say because it's proportional. Okay, so I was trying to think like, can we imagine I have an edge here, my car would have an edge on that, on that, with the, the door. Could this microsaccade itself just tell me based on this movement of the edge, how far away it is? The answer is no. If I if I think about um, the changing what I'm seeing on the object, yes. If I think about the moving the entire object, yes. But if I'm just looking at the edge of the object, it's going to be the same matter. What it doesn't really move at all. They, they both move the same rate, the same distance. So it's just the question I was trying to say was. Could the microsecot just on its own, looking, not even knowing what object you're looking at, just using some any feature on its in its face, and how that feature moves, um, um, you know, could that be used to determine? I feel like I can share a degree of hope that it demonstrates this better than maybe this conversation is. <laughs> so does that seem like a uh, not a lot of help? No, no, but you, you're just visualize, like literally just like visualize like the image on the retina. And then move the same invariant object. I think the I think the image will move faster, but the uh, the particular edge I'm talking about won't move faster. But the, the image has an edge in it, so for me the edge is moving faster too. I just I can just see it right here. I can do this check right here, and I can say, man, I don't want to move my eyes. The, the edge of the door and the edge of my finger are the same. They occupy the same space. You know, they're not like one's blue and one's the other. So, but clearly the amount I move on the door and the amount I move my finger is different. So if I think about the object moving, yeah, the, or my, how much of the displacement across the object, yes, it's changed, but the actual edge itself, just the raw edge, doesn't change. It doesn't seem like, I, I don't know, I, maybe I'm missing that. Yeah, I thought the micro uh, result, maybe I misunderstood it, was about like, okay, you have these retinal ganglion cells, they're kind of noisy, they're kind of unevenly distributed. So the benefit of these micro saccades is that like you kind of smooth it, slide them over and you get like a better. That was Bruno's paper. Yeah, yeah, but we're saying that doesn't have to be uh, the only thing that's going on. Sure. Yeah. Um, I bet you there's a whole bunch of papers on how the eyes determine distance. You oh, got, there are, there are. Yeah. Decades and, old. Yeah. And, um, and the question is obviously we know we can use binocular uh, rivalry for that. Um, but it's also possible that um, we use a lot of different cubes to figure out. Maybe the, 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 I don't know the microsaccades. You can probably just sort of try down microsaccades and distance and probably find something. Anyway, uh, we got it. This is a long Yeah, this has nothing to do with really microsaccades. It's just a fundamental geometric. The question, topic. well, we were trying to understand how a single column, I was asking the question, can a single column do flash inference at different poses and different distances and different scales and so on? That was the question I was trying to say. I'm, I'm going to say it should. It should be able to do that. And it's flash inference? Uh, not flash inference. It, it has to be able okay. to do, first of all, it has to be able to do inference with them and how yeah. to be able to figure that out. And then once you understand how we could do that, which is more than we've asked it to do in the past, uh, and once you ask them to do that, then we can ask, okay, how could they vote um, in a way that makes sense for flash inference? And so one of the questions, uh, I guess, was would you get any kind of knowledge about um, distance to the object? Um, in a micro saccade as the column was looking there uh, or not. It's not it's not the critical question. Yeah, but I was just saying it might be helpful. It might be that, helpful. that dynamic nature of yeah. that might be helpful. I think not even just for determining distance, but also for making predictions that can be validated in, in a flash inference paradigm. Yeah, so 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 we know if, if we're dealing with a single column, we don't flash inference is not gonna work. So the question is, how does a single column solve all these these pose issues, um, which we talked about for touch, but we didn't really solve for vision. And, um, and I'm suggesting we maybe we just focus on that single column again and think about it that way. And then when you can ask how does a single column be able to solve all these problems and figure out all these different variables, then you can ask how it hopes to do that. I'm just, maybe this is just for me to think about. All right, so this is the this is the general this is the easy one. Now you have a more detailed one. Right. So, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see when it's ready. <laughs> I, I would say that because I did one today, I'm less likely to. Do uh, one, so. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Anyone else want to talk about this further? You said, are we done streaming? Uh, so if we're done, I'm sure you're done, sir. Okay. I'm done. Matt? Okay.
Okay. <laughs> okay, guys, I'll be right back. Okay, I just want to see what they're going to talk about. Okay, I'm no longer streaming my screen or audio. Yes. It's it's a really long USB cable. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was for a camera uh, for the uh, meetup that we did. Um, I I thought I might use it again, so I shoved it under there. <laughs> okay. Um, do you guys have more to talk about? Uh, should I stick around? <laughs> 